Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads us into the word every time. Lord, we pray you grant us real understanding of your word, even tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that the blessing of reading the word, studying the word, understanding the word, obeying the word, will come upon every one of us tonight in Jesus' name. We pray for everyone listening here and all the other locations, Lord, we pray that you'll touch every life. Turn us around, Lord, and do your work of grace in every heart. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're reading from verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger, the judge of all such, as we also have warned you and testified. That's the passage the Lord is leading us to tonight, and he's talking about sanctification, and talking about freedom from the filthiness of the flesh. Bring those two things together, sanctification and freedom from the filthiness of the flesh. There's something very significant that the passage begins with. It's in verse 3. It says, for this is the will of God. You understand that when Jesus came into this world, he came to reveal. He came to demonstrate. And he came to perform and to fulfill the very will of God. Every step he took, every word he said, every prayer he prayed, every one he touched, every act that he acted out, everything was in the will of God. And then he taught us how to pray. And he wants us to follow him, to just be like him. And he said, when we pray, here is the prayer we ought to pray. In the middle of that prayer, thy kingdom come. And when your kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. And so then you understand, the will of God is very, very important. If I were told in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, how singularly important the will of God is. And in your own life, in your own experience, working with God day by day, how the will of God ought to be the very center of your life. It says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise. That means be wise. Don't be unwise. The way you live. The things you do. The pattern you follow. And the principles by which you organize your life. Do not be unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. Even as sinners, what's the will of God? Your salvation. And then when you become a believer, what's the will of the Lord? Your purity of life, your holiness, your sanctification. That's why the passage we are looking at today begins with, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. The will of God for all his people in every generation. In all the churches, is their sanctification. Whatever the definition of that word sanctification may be, and whatever the description and the demonstration of that word sanctification may be, one thing is sure and certain. And here it is, that it is the will of God for each and every one of us. It is the will of God for you in particular. Many times there are some churches that will classify the doctrines of the Bible. And it will say that, well, sanctification is such and such a doctrine for this particular church. 
Other people will say this other doctrine is for that particular church. And then they slash out, they cut down into pieces the word of God and give a peace to this other church, a peace to the evangelicals, a peace to the Pentecostals, a peace to the historic churches, a peace for all the other churches. But this is telling us that there's nothing like that. Everything Christ provided on the cross of Calvary, everything that he shed his blood to give everyone on the cross of Calvary, it is the will of God for you, for me, for everyone, for everyone in this church and for everyone in any other church. A true follower of Christ will delight in the will of God and will plead for the Lord to grant him understanding, to grant him willingness, to grant him the ability to do his will. We're told in Psalm 40, I'm reading there from verses 7 and 8. Psalm 40, telling us in verses 7 and 8, as you read these words, you understand what the Lord is saying about his will. And if you're a real child of God, the heart you ought to have, the attitude you ought to have, and the disposition you ought to have, the response you ought to have to what is revealed as the will of God. Psalm 40 verse 7, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, is reaching up me, I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy law is within my heart. And that means then when you are following the Lord Jesus Christ and you truly, fully, wholeheartedly belong to him, here is your delight, here is your joy, here is your passion that you will want the will of God to be revealed unto you and then to do that will and one of the wills of God is your sanctification. We're looking at Psalm 143, Psalm 143. Looking at verse 10, it says, teach me to do thy will. It's saying that naturally we're ignorant and naturally we're uh, unable, incapable of doing the will of God. And saying, oh God, I just love that will. I delight in that will. I cherish that will. And I know that it's doing that will that will make me part of the family of the living God. Because it says, here is my brother, my sister, my mother, the people that do my will. The will of the Father is in heaven. That's why the Psalm is his spring, teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. That means then when we have the will of God, righteousness, uprightness, holiness, sanctification will be the delight of our heart. It is well pleasing to God when he can say about you, about me, about us, about the church, and about everyone that names the name of Christ, that I found a man, I found a woman. I found a minister, I found a servant after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, taught us to pray that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We must be mindful of Christ's emphasis on the centrality of the will of God in our lives. He said it over and over. In fact, he wants the people that run after miracles and prophecies and signs and wonders. He said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of God, but they that do the will of my Father who is in heaven. He said, many will come to me in that day and said, Lord, have we not done this and done that and said that and spoken that, manifested this and operated this in your name? And we'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity, because the center of following the Lord and the center of pleasing the Lord, they neglected and they abandoned. They didn't understand that the very center or pleasing the Lord is that we do the will of God. And he says, because of that, he'll tell them, I never knew. In fact, when you think about the Holy Spirit, he's making intercession for us. And the Bible says, according to the will of God. What does that mean? He's making intercession for us to be sanctified, to be holy, to be pure. Because the very center of the will of God is a sanctification and that's what he's praying for. The ministry of faithful ministers in the church cannot be complete, cannot be commended by God until they are committed always laboring fervently for everyone, every member of the church in their prayers, in their preaching that we may stand perfect and complete in all the will of 
God. Uh, this will of God we're talking about for you to have a rounded understanding, a complete understanding, and for you to have a rewardable understanding. Uh, let's look at this uh, from the point we're born again. Our salvation is the will of God. And then after you're born again, our sanctification, purity of heart, holiness of life is the very will of God. Galatians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. You're saying, is it the will of God for me to be saved? Is it the will of God for me to get to heaven? Is it the will of God for me to be cleansed and washed and transformed by the blood of the Lamb? There are some people, they don't know. They say, well, I don't know whether it's the will of God for me to be saved or not. They hear about salvation. And they hear about turning away from sin. They hear about a change of life. If any man be in Christ, a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. And they're still wondering, is that the will of God for me to be saved? Look at the word of God. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Who gave himself our sins. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. Deliverance from the present evil world. Salvation. Conversion. A change of life. A change of life. Everything is the very will of God. First Timothy, I'm looking at chapter 2. First Timothy, chapter 2. The will of God. That's a salvation. A born again. You're living the life that glorifies the Lord. That's the will of God. Before you come to sanctification, of course... You must be saved. You count one before you count two. It says in First Timothy chapter two verse three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have how many people? All men to be saved. Who will? That's the will of God. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? That is the will. Of God. We're looking at Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. Second Peter chapter three. We're looking at verse nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards word, not willing that any should perish, not willing that any sinner should be lost. That anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You understand then, if you're wondering, what's the will of God? The will of God is that you should be saved. The will of God is that every backslider should be restored. The will of God is that all believers, after we're saved, we seek the Lord, the face of the Lord, that we be sanctified. Many people are looking for, you know, the will of God, the will of God in marriage, the will of God in my job, the will of God in prosperity, the will of God in my healing, the will of God in escape from enemies, the greatest and the highest will of God is that you will be sanctified for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. We're looking at this passage. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 4. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, sanctification by faith in his faithfulness. He's faithful. He has promised. And the word of God says, faithfully see the promise. You also will do it. Because he's faithful, that's why we have faith in him. That's why we know he's done it for people like Enoch, people like Samuel, people like Daniel, and people like Paul, people like all those apostles of old, and all those believers of old, he sanctified them. And because he did that, he said, it's no respect our persons, I'm God, I change not. Because of that faithfulness, that's the reason why we have faith in him. And today, as you put that faith in Christ, he'll sanctify, purify you thoroughly and completely, entirely in Jesus' name. Sanctification by faith faith in his faithfulness. Number two, separation from all filthiness of the flesh. Separation from all the filthiness of the flesh. Number three now. In number three, we're looking at uh, that and that is spirituality and freedom from fraud. Let's go back to number one. Number one, sanctification by faith in his faithfulness. Let's come to First Thessalonians chapter four. The first part of verse three says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I want you to look at that little word there is. 
very important, very essential. For this is the will of God. He could have said it was the will of God. At the time when Jesus was, you know, on earth, he prayed for his disciples to be sanctified. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul could have said that was the will of God, which means no more. It was an old doctrine, an archaic doctrine. It was an old experience. But this was the will of God. Even their sanctification, no. Or Paul could have said, put in the future. There are some people that say you cannot be free from sin while you are still here on earth. And he will say, for this will be in the future the will of God. Even your sanctification, Paul says, no. Not was, not will be. Even now in the present time. In which we are living now. This era and this dispensation. When people are living in the midst of temptation and trial. In the midst of all the pollutions of the flesh. It says in the present tense. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. We are looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I read from verse 17 again. And then we jump down to verse 25. For you to know that what Jesus Christ sacrificed. But Jesus Christ paid the price. It's so that you and I and everyone related with Christ will be sanctified. It says in Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding. Watch the will of the Lord is. It says, hey, don't be unwise. If you go through life, never read me about sanctification. If you go through life, not appreciating sanctification. If you go through life, trampling upon, belittling sanctification. If you go through life, just hazy, confused, ignorant about sanctification. It says, that's unwise. That's unwise. It says, the very thing that will qualify you to see the Lord, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God and he says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord he says the very thing that will make you see the Lord on the final day is this sanctification and holiness be wise he says be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is verse 25 husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It says the reason why Christ gave himself, gave himself for the church, shed his blood for the church, is so that the church will be cleansed and sanctified. And then he tells us the result of that in verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, what makes the church glorious? Sanctification. Holiness. You know, there are many people, you know, they compare church to church and say, you know, this church has a good building. The other one will say, this church has some highly placed people in that church. Other people have some other yardstick and say, this church, look at the quality and look at the state and the standing and the status. And then they say, because of that, they think that that church is higher than all the other churches. But the word of God is saying, if there is anything that makes the church glorious, anything that makes a church at the very heart of the almighty God. It says, I love that church and please with that church is a singular experience of holiness, purity of heart and sanctification. It says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be, tell me the word, holy and without blemish. And that means then that sanctification, that's what we are praying for. That every believer that knows the Lord, every believer that is standing in the Lord will go back to the cross, will go back to Calvary, will go back to Christ and say, Lord, I want to be glorious. I want to be without wrinkle, without spot, without any blame. I want you to cleanse me, purge me, purify me in the blood of the Lamb because that is the will of the Lord. For In fact, you are going to find it very, very easy. To find the will of God in any other area. You know, they pray and they fast. Oh, God, show me your will. I want to get married. Show me your will. I want to relocate. Show me your will. I want to go and walk here or there. You're going to find it much, much easier 
to find the will of God in any other area of your life after you have found the will of God in sanctification. After he purifies your heart and sanctifies you and makes you holy and makes you spotless and then there is nothing, there is no ulterior motive in your heart or any bad attitude. You are sanctified through and through. It's going to be easy to know the will of God in every other area. If there's anything you should be concerned about then it is this sanctification that are sanctified and then your life is pure and righteous transparently holy night and day anywhere you find yourself Leviticus chapter 20 Leviticus chapter 20 I'm reading from verses 7 and 8 sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy well, something is very clear there sanctify yourself be ye holy that means they are the same sanctify yourselves and be ye holy holiness and sanctification they are the same sanctification and holiness are the same sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God and ye shall keep my statutes and do them that means sanctification will lead to deeper obedience implicit obedience unquestioning obedience implicit obedience to the word of the lord i am the lord which sanctify you he will do it i said he will do it because it is the will of God, even your sanctification. That sanctification is also purity of heart. That's why you read in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, we're looking at verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them. Talking about the house of Cornelius. That the house of Cornelius, Peter went there. And while he was still speaking, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And then Peter said, this poor God is same thing that we've got. We are saved, they are saved. We are sanctified, they are sanctified. And then you say we are filled with the Holy Ghost and they are filled with the Holy Ghost. The Lord has not put any difference. What does that mean? We are Jews and they are Gentiles. We are Israelites and they are not of Israel but anyone that calls on the name of the Lord. There's no difference whether it's this church or that church. Whether it is Jewish or it is Gentile. He puts no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. And that's what the Lord does. That's what he did for other people. That's what he's going to do for you. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 all through to verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 19. 2 Timothy, looking at chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. We will not know. You cannot tell. How can you tell? You only look at the faces of people. You only look at the dressing of people. You only look at the scarf or the heart or whatever. You only look at the, you know, whatever the physical appearance of the people. You only listen to their testimonies. How can you tell? How can you tell whether those testimonies are true or not? I belong to the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. I live in the church. I belong to the church. I got saved. 19 such and such. I got saved. 2000 and such. How can you tell whether that is true or not? The Lord knows them who are is. Whatever people think about you, that's nothing. Whatever people say about you, that's nothing. Look at Samuel. He saw Eliab and he said, the anointed of the Lord is before me. Samuel, why did you say that? He looks like the anointed of the Lord. And then God said, Samuel, I've rejected him. Because God seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward part. That's right. That's all we're looking at. The children of God, they believe in God, the members of the church, they're saved, they're sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't say that again. Only God knows who is really born again, who is going to heaven, or is not going to heaven. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? That's the evidence. Depart from iniquity. In verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. That's it. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified. You only become a vessel unto honor when you are sanctified. If you are not sanctified, how can you be a vessel of honor? What makes us vessels of honor is sanctification. Unsanctified people, unsanctified hearts, unsanctified lives, they are 
vessels of dishonor. They'll dishonor the gospel. They dishonor the church. They dishonor the name by which we're called. They'll dishonor the doctrines of the Bible. They dishonor the very beauty of the Christian life. They dishonor the very center of the Christian profession, sanctification. But it is when you are sanctified and purified and made holy, it says then you'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and then it says, and meet and suitable for every good work. I pray God will accomplish it in us. Give me a good, good day. Amen. Let's come back to First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Very important. It says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Then it says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. Look at that word. His vessel in sanctification and honor. In sanctification and honor. If you come back to Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21, you're going to see that word vessel again. It says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be what? A vessel unto honor. A vessel unto honor. And then in first chapter 4, verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess is vessel in sanctification and honor. It's wonderful to get sanctified. It's wonderful to be holy. Wonderful to be righteous. Wonderful to be pure through and through. Transparently pure. Your motives are pure. Your heart is pure. Your thoughts are pure. Your actions are pure. Your lifestyle is pure. Your character is pure. Your surrounding is pure. Even your language, even your look, everything is pure, sanctified. But I want to ask you a question. Why is a vessel clean or cleansed? Why is the vessel to be sanctified and to be in honor? You know, I think that's something we need to understand. In this church, we're talking about sanctification quite a lot, and we preach about sanctification quite a lot, but many people don't understand why is a vessel to be clean. There are some vessels that are sanctified, some vessels that are holy, some vessels that are righteous and pure, but they are just for exhibition. The purpose of Cleaning the vessel, cleansing the vessel, sanctifying the vessel, and the purpose of making holy, making pure the vessel, they do not understand. And you begin to think about it, that oh, why is the vessel cleansed? Why is the vessel purified? Why is the vessel purged? Why is the vessel refined? It's for a purpose. And if you are sanctified, but you know, you don't know the purpose, but that's sanctification. By the grace of God, no fornication, no adultery, no immorality, no impurity, and your vessel is sanctified and pure. And I'm asking you, you are pure? What next? You are pure? You are holy? What next? I don't know. I'm just pure. There's a reason for that. Look at the word of God. In First Kings, I'm reading from chapter 17, verse 10. First Kings, chapter 17, we're looking at verse 10. First Kings, chapter 17, verse 10. So, he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water. Tell me the rest. In a vessel. Give me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. You know why we have a vessel? It's so that we can put some water there and then offer it for other people to drink. That's the reason for the vessel. Clean vessel, thank God. Pure vessel, thank God. Refined vessel, thank God. Righteous vessel, thank God. Are you taking the water of life to those who are thirsty? Are you bringing the water of life, message of salvation, to other people who are thirsty? I'm holy. That's not the end. The reason why your vessel is sanctified, the reason why your vessel is holy, is so that you'll be able to give the water of life unto the people that are thirsty. You know, some people say they are sanctified, sanctified, sanctified. They never open their mouths to talk to other people about being saved. They never give the water of life to other people. The purpose why you're sanctified is so that you'll be able to be a vessel of honor that is ready and meet and suitable for every good Good work. We're looking at Second Kings chapter four. Second Kings chapter four. I'm reading from verses three and four. Second Kings chapter four. We're looking at verses three and four. Then he said, "Go borrow the vessels." That's the word again. Vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, and borrow not a few. And when thou art come in. 
thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. You see that? The reason why you are a cleansed vessel is so you can pour out to other vessels that are empty. Other vessels that do not have the oil, the ointment, the Holy Spirit, so that out of you will flow rivers of living water and it will flow unto other people. You know, many people that just um, praise the Lord, I'm saved, praise the Lord, I'm sanctified, praise the Lord, I'm a holy vessel, a righteous vessel. Pour your life out or to other people. Because the reason why you have a vessel is not just to, you know, demonstrate. It's not for show. It's not for exhibition. It's not just to stay behind the glass and then say, look at that vessel. That vessel is clean. That vessel is pure. Bring that vessel out and let that vessel pour some oil. Oil of comfort. Oil of admonition. Oil of encouragement into the lives of other people. That is, they were sanctified vessels. In fact, we are told in Isaiah chapter 66. I'm reading there from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 66. Oh, talking about sanctification. It's good to be sanctified. Wonderful. Sanctified and pure. Holy and righteous. And then you have that vessel, sanctified, pure, holy, righteous vessel. The reason for that is so that you can pour out the message, give out the message to the people that need to know. Isaiah chapter 66, we're looking at verse 20. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts and to my holy mountain Jerusalem says the Lord as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And that's the reason why you're a vessel that is sanctified and clean or cleansed or purified or holy and righteous that will offer something, offer something. Uh, you know, there are people that come to the church and uh, they don't offer anything in the church. They're not working for the Lord. They're not serving the Lord in any way. They just come in and then they go and they come in and they go out. We're planting new churches and they've been in the church for seven years, for 10 years, for 12 years. And then we'll say, what are you going to do? We're planting new churches satellite churches want to put the church everywhere so that people have opportunity of hearing the gospel well are you saved of course i'm saved are you sanctified yes i'm sanctified are you going to join us as we're planting these churches so we can do something for the glory of the lord well i just love holiness and sanctification hey the reason why you're sanctified and why you are cleansed is so that you can bring an offering unto the Lord. In that vessel, let your sanctified vessel then bring something into the house of the Lord. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 48 verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah chapter 48. I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah chapter 48 verse 11. It tells us what the Lord wants us to understand about the reason why you're a vessel. And if you're a vessel, you have some water of life to give to other people. If you're a vessel, you have some offering to offer from that vessel unto the house of the Lord. If you're a vessel, cleansed vessel, holy vessel, righteous vessel, sanctified vessel, you have something to offer. The purpose why the vessel is cleansed, made righteous and holy and sanctified is to offer something in the service of the Lord. In Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 11, Moab has been at ease from his youth and he has settled on his lees. Lees, there means sediments or dregs. It says he has settled and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel. You know, there are people like that. They have not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Emptied from vessel to vessel. Uh, there are some of us that have been emptied from vessel to vessel. What we have, we pour into that vessel. We pour into that vessel. We pour into that vessel. We go from city to city and we're emptied from vessel to vessel. Or, or some of us, we do some missionary work. We're here like state overseers in Nigeria. Then the Lord takes us out of 
Nigeria, we go to another place, then we go to another country. We're pouring out from vessel to vessel. Or it may be that we're being in an area of work in the church. We're in this area of work, then we're transferred to come into this area of work. We're pouring out from vessel to vessel. Other people, they just stay pute there. The only place they have been since they were born again is that place they are still. They're like Moab. They have not been poured from vessel to vessel. Neither has sea gone into captivity, neither. Therefore, his taste remaineth in him. The only language he knows how to speak is the language of you know, that locality where he has been all his life. He has never changed location. He has never moved from place to place, being a blessing to the lives of people. And then it says, his scent is not changed. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send unto him wanderers, and they shall cause him to wander, and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. It says that they don't do it voluntarily. Uh, you know, you remember when, you know, the Lord was teaching us uh, here through uh, the word of God and then we said every section of the church will contribute a tenth a tithe of what they have and then you contribute to church planting and to uh, making the church expand and to grow that in that section we contribute if you're 200 there give us 20 if you're 400 there give us 40 and give a tenth of what you have so we can pour from vessel to vessel from locality to locality to from local government area to local government area so that the church will move forward and the lord is saying if you refuse to do that and say no my own vessel, I'm sanctified, but I'm just to stay there. We're not to pour from vessel to vessel, and we're not to do anything much more than what we have been doing. The Lord says, I'm going to send wonders unto them, and then eventually, he says, they will even break their bones. The reason why we become vessels is so that we can do the work of the Lord. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 15. Vessel, vessel. The vessel, sanctified vessel. When we read all that, we just am sanctified. I'm a sanctified vessel. I'm pure. I'm holy. Do something with that sanctified vessel. Acts of the apostles. I'm looking at chapter nine, verse fifteen. Chapter nine, verse fifteen. But the Lord said unto him, "Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me." You'll be a chosen vessel. Why would somebody be a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel? That's the reason why you become a chosen vessel, a purified vessel, a sanctified vessel, a cleansed vessel. It says, so as to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and all the other people. Please remember, the reason why we're sanctified is not just to sit down there in church and say, I'm sanctified and sanctified and sanctified all over and over again. It's so that you will be a chosen vessel bearing the name of the Lord before kings, before Gentiles, before the children of Israel. We're we'll coming to point number two now, and we're talking about separation from all filthiness of the flesh. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 3 all through to verse 5. Here he's telling us about the life of the believer. The life of the believer. How you are separated from all the filthiness of the flesh. First Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 3. It says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. Before I go on, we're going to, you know, make it a personal. You know, sometimes when we read the word of God, and just read all this ye and you and thou and thee and them and they. And we do not personalize it. You do not know the benefit therein. Instead of that place where it says you, we're going to put I, me. Is that all right? I said, is that all right? I read it first and then you read it after. And just notice what we're doing now. For this is the will of God, even my sanctification, that I should abstain from fornication. Everybody now personalize it once you go. Praise the Lord. Anything different from that is not the will of God for you. Anything away from that is not the will of God for you. For this is the will of God. Even my sanctification. Remember that when temptation comes. Remember that when some neighbors, some friends, some relatives are trying to drag you down. 
are trying to make you polluted, trying to make you unclean, trying to corrupt your life, corrupt your mind. Remember that when somebody is trying to bring some pornographic things, so remember that when somebody who appears kind of uh, boisterous and courageous and, you know, is a bully, is trying to force you into something that you shouldn't do. Remember that the will of God is above the will of any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, any society here on earth. It says, for this is the will of God, even my sanctification, that I should abstain from fornication. We're looking at verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, and not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. All that verse is telling us is that we should be different from the Gentiles, different from the unbelievers, different from all the other nationals around us, separate from all the filthiness of the flesh. Thessalonica, like every other city in the Gentile world, was given over to uncleanness, given over to pornography, and given over to immorality. Lost and fleshly perversion had eaten deep into the lifestyle of those Thessalonians before the gospel came to them. But now they were forgiven, but now they were converted, and now they were cleansed. And the Lord wanted them to know they must watch against the temptation of the flesh, and fleshly laws which war against the soul, having the experience of salvation and the knowledge of sanctification as the will of God, it was necessary to exhort, it was to admonish them and to warn them that they should abstain from fornication. And the same thing with you, now that you have the knowledge of the will of God, which is your sanctification, it wants you to be admonished. He wants you to understand. He wants you to have proper instruction that you should abstain from fornication. This exhortation to watchfulness was for everyone that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That means his body now in sanctification and honor. The body is referred to as a vessel because of its frailty. Like an earthen vessel which can be easily broken. The body is the vessel in which the soul is lodged. Believers should not be involved in the lust of concupiscence. That's what it says. Look at that verse again in verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Concupiscence, that's a long word. What does that mean? That means gross gratification of the flesh. That means the passion of lust. That none of us should be involved in that passion, in that lust, even as the Gentiles which know not God. What does that mean? As the Gentiles that do not know God, our neighbors that don't know God, you see what they do, you know how they dress, and you know the lifestyle they live, and you know that for them, they don't understand that, you know, a man should keep only to his wife, a woman should keep only to her husband, and therefore you find them just, you know, here and there with all that kind of immoral relationships. It seems that you find in schools, whether secondary school or university or, you know, all those tertiary institutions, they don't understand because they're Gentiles, because they are sinners. They are not born again. And when you see that, don't say if they are doing it, why can't I do it? If they live like that, why can't I live like that? You can't because you are different. You can't because you are a vessel unto honor. You can't because you are a sanctified vessel, a holy vessel, a righteous vessel. And because you are a different person, you are not to live according to the Gentiles which know not God. It tells us then we need to possess a vessel and preserve a vessel in holiness and sanctification unto the Lord. How do we do that? Number one, you present your body every day unto the Lord as a living sacrifice say, Lord, I bring my body to you today. I'm going out and I want everything I do with that body. My eyes, my ears, my mouth, my mind, my hands, my legs, every part of me to be to the glory of your name. Number two, you spend much time in the word of God. How will a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Number three is to pray in faith that God should keep you from sinning against him. That's what he wants to do. That's a prayer he answers most rapidly because that is the will of God. He wants to keep us away free from sin. And when you pray that God today will help you and keep you from all forms of sin, he answers that prayer speedily. Number four is to discipline yourself 
and redirect the physical drive in you to things that are morally, ethically, spiritually higher. That's what Paul the Apostle says. He said, I put my body under. I bring it unto subjection. Less after witnessing to other people, talking to other people, instructing other, preaching to other people, I myself should be a castaway. Number five is to control your thought life. Be careful what your mind fits on and who you associate with because your thoughts are the very center of your life. And then number six, be occupied much with Christ and much for the kingdom of God and for him. When you are very active, your mind will not be roaming here and there. It's a lazy person, an idle person, a person that is all alone and is nursing all his wounds and is feeling lonely and feeling dejected, feeling sorrowful. And those are the people that the devil will come to tempt into immorality, into evil. But when you are active, you are here, you are there. I think about that man that is, you know, driving a nail into the plank, or a man that is, you know, laying the block and doing this and that, or a man that is very busy and very active. He doesn't have time for all the things that those Gentiles are occupied about. Be occupied. In so winning, be occupied in reaching out to the laws. And when you're occupied like that, you'll find that those temptations will just slip by you. You'll be victorious in Jesus' name. Number seven, in the moment of fierce temptation, think of your future. In the moment of fierce temptation, think of eternity and seek God for grace and divine assistance to overcome. And the Lord will make you an overcomer in Jesus' name. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm reading there from verse 1. Separation from all the filthiness of the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we we'll look at verse 1. Verse 1 tells us, it says, Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and all the filthiness of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God. Let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh, all the filthiness of the spirit, all those polluting things and thoughts and ideas that come into the heart. Cleanse yourself from that and plunge yourself into the blood of the lamp every moment and then he'll make you clean and keep you clean. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. You find what the Lord is saying about sanctification. Sanctification, that means that you are separated from the defilements and the evil all around you. Second Chronicles chapter 29, we're looking at verse 5. It says, and he said unto them, hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. It says, holy place and filthiness, they're not compatible. They do not agree. They do not mix. And because it's the holy place, search and find out and sweep out and cleanse all the filthiness out of the holy place. It says you are the holy temple of God and you are the holy place now. Because of that, filthiness should not be in your life, in your heart, in your thought, in your mind, in your house, in your room, anywhere. Fieldiness, moral fieldiness should not be there. Therefore, you carry out, you send out, you eject, you sweep out, you take away all uncleanness, all impurity. We're looking at Psalm 51. Psalm 51, I'm reading there from verse 2. Psalm 51, reading from verse 2. He wants us to be free from the works of the flesh, from all the fieldiness of the flesh. Psalm 51, verse 2, wash me thoroughly. Not just wash me, but thoroughly. Not just wash me, wash me completely. Not just wash me, wash me through and through. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Not cleanse us, cleanse them. You know the way some people pray, especially if they are kings. They are praying for other people, cleanse them. If they are leaders, cleanse them. If they are pastors, cleanse them. He said, me. Even a king needs holiness before he can get to heaven. Even a pastor needs holiness before he can get to heaven. Even a leader needs holiness before he can get to heaven. Even a bishop needs holiness before he can get to heaven. Anyone, everyone, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Therefore, the king was praying. He said, cleanse me 
from all my sin. And then he tells us, look at it from verse 6. In verse 6, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge. What's the next word? Tell me out loud. Pronounce those two words together. Purge me, purge me, purge me. I'm telling you, if somebody prays like this from his heart, he goes before the Lord and says, Lord, there's one thing I'm asking from you. I'm not asking for money, for gold, for silver. I'm not even asking for necessities of life. I'm asking for necessities for eternity. And purification, sanctification, holiness is so essential for eternity. Purge me with Aesop, and I shall be clean. And wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What a prayer. When we pray that prayer sincerely, the Lord will answer. He will answer our prayers. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. We're looking at it from verse 25. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. And that's the desire of the Lord, not the passion of the Lord. And that's what he wants to accomplish in your life, in my life, in our lives all together. He says, and then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness. It is some of our filthiness. I said, it is some of our filthiness. All, all, anything that is filthy, and the Lord is saying in my sight, that is not clean. I'm telling you that, you know, sometimes uh, you may be doing something that your neighbors may not say anything wrong in that. You know, you have a girlfriend, they have girlfriends too. You only have one, they have three, they have four. You have two wives. No, that's not strange to the people of the world. Some of them have four, some of them have five. If you only have two, that's okay with them. And maybe you're stealing little by little, and you're stealing just maybe a thousand naira or maybe a hundred pounds or hundred dollars. That's no string to them. They steal millions, they see billions. That's no string to them. And therefore, you may be all right before them, but in the sight of God, He doesn't want to see any spot, any stain, any impurity. And therefore, it's not in the sight of me. You say, Well, I'm okay, I'm all right. Even people around me, they know that I'm all right. People around you may feel that you're all right, but does God know that you're all right? That's why it's the Lord himself examining you and looking at your life and saying, hey, this is wrong. This cannot be there. This is a wrong attitude. This defilement, this filthiness. That's why it says, myself, I will do it. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean and from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. He will do it. I said they will do it. And then in verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. You know, if somebody is giving you a gift, if you respect that person, you appreciate the gift. You love the gift. You're not going to, you know, get the gift and throw it down, trample upon it. Your attitude to the gift shows your attitude to the giver. If the almighty God is saying, this is the gift I have for you, and he's thinking of the very best for you and for me. And he says, I'm giving you this gift in your heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. He says, this is my gift for you. If you love the giver, you love the gift. If you appreciate the giver, you appreciate the gift. If you want to honor the giver, you're going to honor the gift. And then he says, I will put my spirit within you. And cause it to walk in my statues. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. I pray the Lord will do it. And accomplish it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Now we're talking about this separation. But I need to clear up something before you as a church. You know, in this church, when we say separation, almost everybody understands separation. Be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. But as you look at this church, almost all the people in the church who have made separation to become isolation. Separation to become insulation. I'm separate 
Because of that, we don't talk to anybody. I'm separate. We think that separation means isolation. It means that I'm isolated over here. Don't come near me. I'm holy. I'm pure, righteous, sanctified. I'm just on my way to heaven. Are you going to heaven alone? Don't insulate yourself. Insulation means you surround yourself with a particular wall. It may be your attitude or your look or your stance or the way you, you know, relate to people, the way you react to people. When you want to come near, he's a sinner. I am a saint. He is unholy. I am holy. He is unrighteous. I am righteous. He is of that tribe. I am of this tribe. Insulation. You insulate yourself. You isolate yourself that nobody can even talk to you. That's not separation. The separation the Lord is talking about is so that you can keep away from defilement. Separation is to preserve your saltiness. We are the salt of the earth. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading there from verse 13. Understand what separation is? Never get into the era of insulation, isolation. Because I'm separate. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. I'm holy. I'm righteous. Because of that, you insulate, you isolate yourself. Don't do that. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You know, sometimes, you know, your neighborhood, uh, something just happens unexpectedly. And then you smile. And then you laugh. And one of your neighbors come around. Hey, madam, do you ever smile? This is strange. So you laugh. And then you become serious immediately because you realize, I've been isolating myself now. I've spoiled my isolation. Smile. Let people approach you. Let people talk to you. Let people be able to touch your life. And you touch the lives of other people. And not just isolate yourself. And then people think you cannot smile because you're a Christian. You cannot laugh because you're a Christian. You are the salt of the earth. The separation is for you to preserve your identity as a Christian. And then your holiness, your righteousness, so you don't do what they do. But then, if the salt is isolated in a bottle, the salt is insulated inside a bottle, the salt will be good for nothing. It is as we mix with the people. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. I mean, you know, uh, we need to want the church. You hear that the church is serving, you know, secondary school, and because of that now, some people will... Just switch over. All they are thinking about now is, you know, deeper life high school, deeper life high school. Deeper life high school is good. But we have youth fellowship and we have the youth ministry. And we reach out to all the youth in all the other schools. It's not that because now we isolate or we bring together some just about 100 or about 120, 150 in a particular state. Then we forget the 10,000 young people we have in our youth outreach. No, we're still mixing with them. It doesn't mean we're going to withdraw all our, you know, children who are in this school and this school and this school and gather everybody together. Make all the salt to come into one bottle. And you call that bottle Deeper Life High School. No, we're still the salt of the earth and our children are everywhere. We're still the salt of the earth and we have all our children that are born again in this school, in this school, in that school and also in Deeper Life High School. That's how we're going to reach the world. Separation does not mean isolation and insulation. We have the separation to preserve the saltiness and the holiness and then we have the reaching out to people and spreading the salt, distributing the salt everywhere so that we can prevent corruption total corruption and total destruction of the world. And let's say, for example, we have a city, or let's say we have, in your place you are coming from, I was just looking at, you know, your place you are coming from, and I studied about the data of your locality. Do you know that if we put everything together, you're more than two million in the locality where you come from. 
And if that two million, if we only have Jeep and I Bible Church in just a corner somewhere, reaching out to only 200,000 people, what do you think about? We we'll still have 1 million 800,000 that do not have the church there. And we isolate ourselves. If there are some people, I'm looking for accommodation now. I'm going to go to only where deeper life people are living. Isolation, isolation. You are the salt of the earth. If we we'll look at it very well, distribute the salt and let the salt affect every meal, every plate, every locality. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He doesn't want us to just stay here isolated. Some people misunderstand. We're holy, we're righteous. We're talking about sanctification. And because of that, we're only living together. Let's go and build a deeper life city. Let's go and build a deeper life village so that all deeper life people, they will go there. No corruption, no sin, nothing like that. We're all holy, insulated from society. How will the world be saved? It's as we look at the two million or maybe one million in another place, one million over there, and we divide everything up and we say for every 5,000 people in this locket, give them a church. Every 5,000 people here, give them a church. 5,000 here, give them a church. And we distribute ourselves all over. That's how to be the real purpose for the purpose of sanctification. The purpose, the reason why we're actually made pure, the Lord will help us. I said the Lord will help us. Uh, you know, when the ordinary salt, the table salt, when they have the table salt, what do they do? It comes when they export it and then comes over here. Distribute over to that state, that state, that state, that state. When you get to the state, every local government has salt. And when it gets to local, every village has salt. Every community has salt. That's how we should be as Christians. We distribute ourselves everywhere. Actually, you know, if we're going to do it right, what we just say is that where you are coming from, that locality, and we need a church for every 5,000 people. And then we divide the population by 5,000. We say, well, we need about 200 churches in your place, 250 churches in your place. And over here, we just divide you to 250 people and then we'll say you go here you go there we'll do missionary work and transfer you from where you are to all those places that's how to distribute the salt we're going to do it i said we're going to do it otherwise your salt will just be there for years born again sanctified for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years, and you're still living in that same place since you are born again and sanctified, and you have no use to everybody. Everybody there knows you, and you know everybody there, but you never talk to one another. Let us be salt. Let's distribute the salt, and then we're going to have the purpose of our sanctification in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse Says that no man, and that means no man, nobody at all, that nobody will be wiser than the word of God, that nobody will say they are saying their own, they are talking their own, they are teaching their own, I am going to be whatever I'm going to be. No, that everybody will submit to the word of God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. In business matters, no man will defraud his brother. In family-related matters, no man will defraud his brother. In any matter at all, then it says over there, because that the Lord is the avenger, the judge of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Defrauding other people, you hear about fraud in the world, you know, some of these uh, places, uh, they go to examine what they're doing in that uh, institution or in that uh, community, and then they say that these people have not been faithful, they have defrauded of you know, millions of naira, millions of dollars, defrauded. It shall never happen to a Christian, it shall never happen to you. We never hear a report about any member of the church, even a new member, a new convert, that you have been involved in defrauding the place of work where you work. Look at Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19, we're looking at verse 13. Leviticus 19, verse 13. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, nor rob him. You won't steal from him. The wages of him which is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. That means employers will be faithful to employees. You will not cheat anyone. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
We're reading from verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 6. Reading from verse 8. The Lord is telling us that uh, defrauding people, cheating people, stealing from people, it will earn you and anyone the judgment of God. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 8. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It's referring to those who defraud others. It's referring to them as unrighteous people. And it says, don't you know, you do that? You've not heard about hell? You do that? Have you not seen the film on hell? Have you not watched the video on hell? You do that? Don't you know that hell is forever and ever? It says, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. God. It says none of those people shall inherit the kingdom of God until they are washed. I pray the Lord will wash us. He will cleanse us, purge us through and through and all those impurities will get out of our lives in Jesus name. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and I'm reading there from verse 17. Romans chapter 12 reading from verse 17. 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. It says, uh, you know, there are some people that will say, they stole from me, I'm going to steal from them. That's like saying, they're going to hell, I'm going to follow them to hell. That means, uh, you know, they're shooting one another and they try to shoot me, I'm going to shoot myself and shoot them too. That means, uh, they gave me poison, I'm going to give them poison too. That means they did evil to me. I'm going to do evil to them too. Or are you going to multiply evil in the society? If they have done evil to you, that means they're evil people. They belong to the devil. Devil means D plus evil. And if they're doing evil, that means they belong to the devil. You're not going to belong to the devil because another person belongs to the devil. You're not going to do wrong because other people are doing wrong. That's why it says recompense to no man. Evil for evil provides things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. If you find people that are backsliding, people that are fleshly, people that are filthy, People that are sinful and they do evil to you. Don't avenge yourself. Don't revenge. Brethren, it says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I pray the Lord will keep us holy and keep us clean all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. Because you know the passage you already said, do not defraud. Why? Because God is the avenger, is the judge of all such. The people that defile other people's wives, those who defile other people's daughters, those people that cheat and rob. It says God is the judge, the avenger of such. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, we're looking at verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. Give me a good amen. Amen. Marriage is honorable in all. You know, there are some people that, you know, they pretend and they say, well, for me, I can hold myself. For me, I can remain pure and holy. For me, you know, women are nothing to me. They're telling lies. And it says marriage is honorable. You know how many people tell me out loud? You know, and the bed, what? On the file. But all mongers and adulterers tell me the rest. God will judge. Those who are pretending and they just stay there and then they do something in secret, doing evil in secret, fornication, adultery in secret and they say, you know, me I'm consecrated, I'm holy. Ah, God knows you. He knows your life. Adulterers and omongers and fornicators, God will judge. I pray you'll escape the judgment of God in Jesus' name. He says to avoid fornication, let everyone have his wife and let every woman have her own husband. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has 
and has counted the blood wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite of the spirit of grace for we know him that said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense says the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people that's why the Lord is telling us to flee from the wrath to come judgment is coming all will be there those who have refused, those who have rejected, when that judgment comes, those who have had the message of salvation, but they were not saved. They have had the message of holiness and sanctification, but they trampled it on their feet. The judgment will come, and it will take them on unawares. I pray that God will keep us, keep us righteous, keep us holy, so that we will escape the judgment and the wrath that is to come. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come unto his baptism, he says unto them, O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He's telling us that we should flee from the wrath to come. If there's any filthiness in your life, flee. Defrauding, flee. Stealing, flee. Secret sin, besetting sin. He knows you, knows your life, knows all your secrets. Flee from the wrath to come. But I want to remind you while you are fleeing, or you keep yourself away, separate from the sins of the world, that you should remember that there are relatives, there are neighbors who should escape the judgment with you. Don't just say, well, I'm separated from sin, I'm fleeing from sin, I don't want the wrath to come, I flee, I flee, I flee all alone. Coming to the Bible study all alone, I flee from the wrath to come. Coming to church all alone, I flee from the wrath to come. And then going to church, your local church all alone, I flee from the wrath to come. There are relatives that you need to warn, you need to talk to them, that they too, they will flee from the judgment to come. I'm looking at Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, and I'm reading there to you from verse 12. Genesis 19, reading from verse 12. And the men said unto the Lord, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law, or thy sons, or thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in this city, bring them out of this place. As you flee from the wrath to come, and you are fleeing from the judgment that is going to come upon people, and you'll suffer in the lake of fire forever and ever. Remember your own relatives, and remember your own neighbors, remember the people around you, that you will bring them out of this polluted world, for we will destroy this place in verse 13, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lord went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Well, at least we love that thing about Lord. The moment he heard, it's not like the people that come to Bible study and they hear about, uh, don't isolate yourself, don't insulate yourself, and they keep on in that isolation. He changed. A lot was not like the people that were here. The reason why were cleansed vessels, poured vessels, refined vessels, purified vessels, sanctified vessels, is so we can pour out the water of life onto other people, pour out the oil onto other people, and pour out an offering onto the lives of other people. He did it. Other people, they just come to the Bible study, they heard, they heard, they heard, they never do anything about it. Be ye not hearers of the word only, be ye doers of the word. We're told that Lord immediately went out and he told them, Up, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. Look at verse 17. It came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape. For thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. The Lord is telling us to escape from the judgment to come. From all the defilement and the defrauding and all the destruction, devastation. They're coming upon this world. But while we flee and while we escape the judgment of God, we'll make sure we tell our neighbors and tell our friends and tell our schoolmates and tell our co-workers and tell everybody, be nice to them. Be 
compassionate on them that they will not perish. That means tell other people how they can escape the judgment coming upon this world. We will do it in Jesus' name. Let the holy vessels give me a good amen. amen. And pour out the water of life onto people around you. And then those of us who are leaders, let's look at our communities and let us distribute all the salt evenly so that there is church in every community even if they're small let's start somewhere so that by the grace of god we'll be able to tell other people that jesus is savior and jesus is sanctifier and many people will come to know the lord in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer we've had a lot we've had a lot and the lord is saying this is that we've had take it to the lord in prayer and say lord help me that i will discover in my life the will of god for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Now you know the will of God. Now you know the will of God. Even your sanctification, your holiness, that's the will of God. Purity of life, that's the will of God. Righteousness, that's the will of God. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That is the will of God. For this is the will of God, even my sanctification. Tell the Lord, and it's the will of God for sinners to be saved. It's not the will of God that anybody should perish. It's the will of God that your mother, your father, your children, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your siblings, that they should be saved. That's the will of God. Your relatives are there. You're not telling them about salvation. You're not doing the will of God. Your friends are there. You see them every day. You never talk to them about salvation. That's not the will of God. I'm sanctified, sanctified vessel, chosen vessel. But you never pour out the water of life onto those who are thirsty. They're roaming about. They want peace of mind. They don't know how to get it. They want joy in life. They don't know how to get that. Are you not telling them? Your chosen vessel, a sanctified vessel, a refined vessel, a reformed vessel, but you're not pouring out the water of life to other people. That's not the will of God. The will of God is that they should be saved. Your child of God, pour it out. Pour the oil of comfort, compassion, love, kindness, good news gospel from vessel to vessel distribute the salt evenly everywhere sanctified vessels are to take a water of life to every community preach the gospel everywhere tell everyone separation does not mean isolation we're separated we want the pollutions of the land let there be Light shining in every street. Let there be salt in every little local community. Let there be the church, a saved church, a sanctified church, a spirit-filled church, a church of sound doctrine. In every community, that's the will of the Lord. He is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. Give them a chance to hear about repentance and to know how they will come to the Lord. That's our spirituality. When we hear the word flee, I will flee, flee from sin, but then we'll remember to tell our relatives, our neighbors, our co-workers, our schoolmates, our age mates, they have never heard. Many of them have never heard, and they don't know what she know. Tell them. Tell them. You should be more righteous than Lord. Tell them. Lord went out. 
And he told those people he knew, related to him, up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy this place. He did his duty. Do your duty. Tell them, flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the judgment to come. Be holy and sanctified. Be a sanctified vessel. But let your vessel, cleanse vessel, take the water of life to everyone around you. Let your salt touch, transform, and season the lives of all people around you. Be a doer of the word.